So one of the more well-known practices that comes out of the traditions associated with Taoism is something called Nei Dan, or internal alchemy. Now, internal alchemy, uh, many people have heard of if they engage with Taoism, um, but a lot of people are a little confused as to exactly what it is, how does it work? Because it's a, is it a meditation system? Is it a Qigong system? Are we sitting as if you might do with a sort of a passion retreat and, and, and absorbed into the breath and developing mindfulness? Or is it more like Qigong where we're circulating something through the body and opening the channel? So it, it can be difficult to sometimes pin down where it is. On, on that spectrum between those two poles. It also doesn't help that there are lots of variations on the way that Taoism presented alchemy. Um, and actually, in my experience now of spending quite a lot of years mixing with different alchemical sects within Taoism particularly, I've had a little bit of experience with some of the Buddhist um, alchemical sects, but primarily within some of the, the Taoist lines, is that as much as anything, I think they present the material differently as in they use different metaphors, different symbols, different ways of explaining the concept, but ultimately the work is very similar. The actual practice pretty much shares a common thread across all of the different branches of, of Taoism. So some of these traditions will present um, the information as kind of, they'll talk about deity realms and they'll present the body like it's a heaven with various gods and demons living within you and kind of discuss the concept here. And obviously this idea of your body being a, a representation of heaven with these gods and deities is, is their way of explaining the alchemical process. It's their conceptual framework that they can work towards. Then we have second group of traditions that will talk about the body in terms of fire and elements and cauldrons and lead and cinnabar and mercury, things like this. And perhaps those are the kind of metaphors that most people are familiar with when they are talking about Nadan. Those kind of terms are quite commonly, commonly shared. And there's even quite a lot of classics translated into English that tend to be from traditions that focus very much on that kind of symbology. Uh, then we have a third branch that I've encountered where they talk about it in terms of the Gua. So they talk about it as almost as if they're teaching you the I Ching, the classic of change, okay, which most people would know as a divination text. So then what they use is the difference between Gua, um, trigrams and hexagrams, these groups of yin and yang lines to discuss the process inside the body. Now, of course, different traditions will borrow from each other's metaphors, but it does become confusing, <laughs> like in the early stages, trying to understand Nadan as much as anything when you're presented with all of these symbols at the same time from all of these traditions. Um, and I think sometimes there's a tendency in literature for us not, or for authors sometimes, not to separate that symbology out. So you end up with even more of a confused task than people would have had in the past because in the past somebody would have apprenticed to a master and they would have used their metaphorical way of explaining the alchemical process but now you end up <laughs> kind of wading through several traditions all at the same time which is a part of the you know the plus side of there being open sharing of information is that many of these secret things aren't hidden anymore but the downside is is an overload of information can be difficult. You almost have to extrapolate the useful parts. So it can be hard. So it's, um, it's quite, a, quite a mission, I suppose, to try to kind of work through all of these kind of teachings. On top of that, it's certainly useful to have a, <laughs> since they're useful, I should say vital, to have a, a teacher that's actually been through a lot of, if not, if not all of, a lot of the process that can kind of help you understand what a lot of this means. So alchemy is something associated, or Nadan specifically, is associated with Taoism. Um, it means, Nay means internal, Dan is, is the elixir, it's actually an ore of cinnabar. It essentially means a spiritual substance, is what they're referring to, um, that is developed within the body through this internal practice. Um, that's, that's really what Nadan, Nadan is. Early Taoist texts didn't really discuss Nadan. So, I mean, if, if you look at something like the Tao Te Ching, you can't really call the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu's writing, um, an alchemical text as such. Although if you're able to decipher some of the hidden meaning behind what Lao Tzu or his contemporaries were discussing in that text, you can see kind of forerunners to aspects of it. Clearly, if you had gone through some of the work within the Tao Te Ching, because the Tao Te Ching is not a philosophical text as such, even though that's kind of what it's interpreted as that's kind of the outer presentation of the Tao Te Ching, which is one of the kind of genius aspects of the text is that it's presented in such a way that to the outer door, to the general public, it appears like philosophy. 
but to the inner door or the initiated, those who have access to the keys to understand the tradition. And what Lao Tzu was talking about is more instructional, it becomes an instructional text. And if you know how it works, you can kind of see um, how the Tao Te Ching is really discussing the, the cause, the, the sort of causes and the conditions that somebody needs to engage with or is advised to engage with by Lao Tzu in order to elevate that person towards um, essentially self-realization. That's what the text is based on. Now, funnily enough, if you understand how the causes and conditions would unfold within someone, actually a lot of the alchemical process, the Nadan process, would naturally arise. Maybe not all of it, but quite a lot of it would arise naturally as a byproduct of following the guidance if the, in the Tao Te Ching, if you have the instructions to go with it. So it's, it's interesting to say that the Tao Te Ching is not an alchemy text, but you can see the early components of it there, you know. Then at some point in Taoism's history, there was an integration of teachings from elsewhere, which is probably going to be coming down ultimately from Indian origins um, at some stage. And there's various kind of mythological stories of how that happened, but um, that's not my forte. Those kind of historical explanations are not my forte. So then what you have is um, a very earlier text called the Canton Chi, which is about 145 AD, 140 AD, something like that, somewhere around there, give or take a few years anyway, maybe 142 AD, I'm not sure. But the Canton Chi is an alchemical text, it's kind of one of the earliest writings on alchemy. And then essentially it developed, and then by the 7th or 8th century um, AD, what you start to have is a kind of consolidation of alchemy as a proper system with a lot more writings and guidances uh, coming out. Um, of, of the traditions. So if we want to look at alchemy as a system, ultimately alchemy means to convert something into something else really, doesn't it? It's kind of an ex <laughs> like come a wacky scientist in his lab creating something from something else. So in the West we had alchemical traditions um, just like we did in the, in the East and obviously alchemy is a Western term given to Nadan which is the internal practice of building the spiritual elixir. But this definition is not, um, certainly not terrible because it really is about transmuting or converting something within the body ultimately to build spiritual potential. That's my term for it perhaps, but that's really what it's about. Can we convert the efficiency of the body and the energy system and all of the systems in it, the hormonal system, the nervous system, it's not just pure energetics. And can we convert them so that the body and the mind function on such a level that it has a greater potential for spiritual connection? And then the byproduct of that is there's a kind of substance, if you like, I know it sounds strange, but there's a substance that is a byproduct of spiritual connection that actually builds inside the body. And this is the Dan, this is the elixir um, that the alchemist is trying to build, trying to gather. Now, there are also Wei Dan, like external methods for building the elixir, um, that in English we call external alchemy. And external alchemy, you'll see all kinds of stories about it where people say um, it's a dead tradition, it died out. <laughs> Actually, many of the practitioners died out because they were consuming um, toxins and poisonous herbs, aconite and mercury and things like this into the body in order to try to kind of ex use external elements to build this elixir on the inside. But actually, the external alchemy traditions are far from dead. They are still going, but they are kind of tucked away in parts of the world. Myanmar or Burma, as lots of people know, it has um, external alchemy traditions that are alive and well. It has some that are kind of, dare we say, on a lower or more public level presenting, shouldn't say lower, should I? And maybe on a more public level, I should say, that are presenting external alchemy medications to people. Um, and then you have more inner door external alchemy traditions that are still really producing that elixir to prolong the life of the practitioners to extraordinary lengths and to build this internal spiritual potential. But internal and external alchemy kind of intertwine to a large degree. There's a connection between them as well. I should say as well, external alchemy is also alive in places like India and Nepal and, and places like this too, and probably in regions of China, but I don't know. I don't have any connection to any external alchemy traditions in um, China, that's for sure. But external alchemy became Chinese medicine, herbal medicine in many ways as well. You'll see aspects of external alchemy way down present within the sort of formation of classical herbal formulas as well, um, which include minerals and, and even metals, precious metals in some branches. So external alchemy was an interesting, certainly an interesting 
subject and interest in practice, but I'll put it to the side for the, for the second because I want to discuss internal alchemy. Now, internal alchemy is a big system, <laughs> just like anything that comes out of the Eastern arts. It's kind of big. There's lots of parts to it. Um, there's all sorts of different methods that are based upon meditative training and um, uh, sort of energetic practice, almost like yogic work. There's breath work. There's mental exercise. There's a whole plethora of aspects to alchemy. Um, and consequently, you'll see all kinds of amazing classics and texts like the Neijing Tu and things that really kind of depict the process in, in very artistic and, and beautiful ways. But really, the core of alchemy, if we kind of strip away all of the, all of the kind of complexity of the wider system, we can bring it down to the basics of really Jing Qi and Shen and the conversion from one into another, which is probably the aspect of Taoism that's the most famous. Now, I think it would be unfair to say that alchemy is only the conversion of Jing Qi to Shen. Of course, there's other parts to it, but this is kind of the core, you know, this is the support and the central pathway that you take with alchemy to understand the conversion of Jing Qi and Shen. So Jing Qi and Shen are translated usually Jing as your essence, that is the common translation, Qi as your energy, um, or for me actually kind of the conversional processes that take place inside your body as well with alchemy. And then Shen is often translated as spirit, or, um, or in the case of alchemy we could maybe talk about spiritual uh, potential, which is something I might discuss a bit further down the line. So anyone familiar with Qigong or Chinese medicine will have heard of these substances of Jing Qi and Shen. Now with the case of Chinese medicine there's a lot of writings on Jing Qi and Shen, these three treasures, the San Bao, but they're almost a bit lacking. I know that's going to sound like blasphemy to the Chinese medical practitioners. They're not lacking for Chinese medicine teachings, of course they're not, but they're a little lacking with regards to alchemy. Actually to understand Chinese medicine doesn't necessarily mean you understand how to alchemically work with Jing, Jing Qi and Shen because there's a whole process that's a little different from what you see in standard Qigong or, or Chinese medicine textbooks. It's a little bit more intricate, a little bit more complex because Chinese medicine is really looking to make sure your Jing Qi and Shen are managed as healthily as possible so you can maintain your vitality and your good health. It's a medical system. Whereas alchemy is looking to take that further. Ultimately, what it's looking at is how can I refine Jing Qi and Shen, my essence, my energy, and my spiritual potential to the highest level I possibly can? How well can I refine these substances um, so that ultimately they can take my spiritual and personal development as far as I can possibly go? Now, before we look at some of the processes involved in these substances, of course, we need to look at kind of the aim, if you like, which <laughs> almost feels a bit sort of um, bad or a bit sort of contradictory because uh, funnily enough within spiritual practices to have a very strong aim or goal or to strive almost becomes counter to what you're doing. But for argument's sake, we'll talk about the aim essentially. It's not the same as the Buddhist path. Okay, Buddhist alchemy, that's different. But when I say Buddhism, I mean the kind of the more common Buddhism people will encounter, things that are based on Vipassana and Shamatha and Sati and, and these kind of qualities. This kind of what we would consider mindfulness meditation is a little different from alchemy with regards to its aim. Because ultimately, if you were to take that kind of Buddhism, and again, as a caveat to that, I know there are many, many branches of Buddhism in many, many different sects. There's Tantric Buddhism, there's religious Buddhism, there is stillness-based Buddhism, if you like. There's there's all different types, okay, and Theravada, Mahayana and Vajrayana present the material in very different ways, but the Buddhism I'm talking about here is the kind of what most people would associate with Buddhism, okay, a kind of stillness-based meditation where you develop mindfulness of an object until it arises, uh, leads to either calm abiding or insight, that kind of Buddhism, yeah. So that kind of practice, if taken to its higher level, highest levels, um, is ultimately about, I guess in the English, what we call enlightenment, but obviously that's not a Buddhist term. They would simply, uh, they would refer to it in another way. But if we say enlightenment, essentially for argument's sake, it would lead to the ability to develop insight through to that which ends dukkha and ultimately liberates someone from samsara. So it is a, that kind of practice is based very much on the kind of subject, subject object dichotomy and um, delusion ultimately to develop insight into the nature of truth and they're doing this through an almost exploration of the nature of the mind and an object such as the breath 
I'm, it might be an oversimplification, but you know what I mean? That's kind of how that system works. So most of that work, that kind of work, is done in the mind or done in the awareness. I think that's fair to say. Now, alongside that, you have all sorts of things, precepts and practices and, and things, but this, this will be the basis of it. Then you have second group, a second group of systems that maybe we could say are more based on devotion um, or maybe even reverence towards something higher. What kind of heartfelt traditions or it's about love and connection and giving up the self. Maybe we could say uh, Christianity might be based on that. A lot of Christian ideals based upon this idea to give love and service to God and, and worship God. A lot of Hindu traditions based on this as well, this kind of idea. Now, I would argue that those kind of traditions lead to a slightly different goal or a different um, outcome to the Buddhist systems we talked about before. It's a slightly different thing. Sometimes people equate them all as the same, but I, I believe them to be different because I think that seeing through to the insight of um, the nature of truth and freedom from samsara, to use Taoist terminology, I know that's horrible to skip between the traditions like that, is almost very up at Antien, you know, it's very um, sort of mind-based kind of work. Whereas that kind of reverence and devotion that you see within maybe we could argue more religious traditions would lead to a more heart-based kind of opening um, which will ultimately lead to a merger with God is the kind of idea okay until you become one with that kind of uh, great love or, or great potential energy that, would, that some people would identify as God so those kind of traditions I would say ultimately lead to a form of awakening rather than what we might label in English enlightenment a slightly different thing you know so is someone with that kind of practice going to get the same kind of outcome? There'll be shared qualities, but a little different. Okay, it's more awakening to the nature of that. Um, it's awakening to the idea that ultimately there's nothing that separates you from God, would be my definition of it. That's kind of the basis of it. The third way of working really is more like alchemy. So alchemy is a little different because alchemy does its work in the body and with the body. Okay, not just the physical body. It does work with the hormonal system and the nervous system um, and, the, and refining all of the other systems like the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, and all of these things to function at a very high level. But it also works with the subtle energies and uh, the channel system and the dantian and all these kind of other aspects of the interior of the body so that your body becomes the workshop. It's almost the opposite end of the spectrum from the mind or spirit-based practice of Buddhism. It's the other way. So here, it's almost it's more tantric in its nature that it's trying to work with these energies within the body and the, the Dantian becoming a kind of key focus to it. It has similarities with um, a lot of Hindu practices based on the idea of the Kundalini and the chakra, although they're different things. There's similarities there in that they're using the vessel of the body. So the result of this is not a enlightenment kind of experience that I would associate with that kind of Buddhist work. It's not an awakening experience I would associate with a merger with God, but it's more of a self-realization or self-actualization process where a person is converted through alchemy into what they call a genren, kind of a sage. But that's done by increasing the efficiency of how the body functions. So on a basic level, if we were to look at the stages of it, the first level would be that ultimately a person's health becomes vibrant because what are you doing? You're increasing the functioning of the body to a very high level. So as their health increases, someone has higher vitality, more vibrance, more awake, more alert, brain functioning well, body functioning well, ultimately a kind of youthfulness, <laughs> maybe not so much in the face, the face might change a little bit as you age, but the body stays fairly youthful with regards to its energy and its spring and its life and its vitality. The next stage after this, we could argue, would maybe be um, the potential for longevity, perhaps, which was not the aim of the practice, but kind of a byproduct of what you were doing, because as the Jing and the Qi and the Shen were mastered to a fairly high level, then the body was able to be preserved and regenerated and renourished to a higher degree. Then beyond this, at the higher levels, when the alchemical process is done to a good level, then the elixir can be formed, okay, the dan, which builds up within the body to create higher degrees of spiritual potential. The result of this is actually more in line with the second path, the path of Christ, the path of merging with God, is that the Taoist, that built enough of this elixir, would open a connection within their body, 
which I can explain at some stage, which would cause them to merge with the one, if you want, to merge with the Tao. It ultimately means that the human being is then linked with the greater, wider cosmos and, cosmos. and this is what I would call a kind of self-realization or self-actualization process. If this is taken further, then of course it leads to what they call spiritual immortality, which as much as anything um, is a, <laughs> a freeing from the physical tethers and a merging with that point that they've connected with. Yeah. So there are definitely similarities between these three paths, right? But they're not quite the same. They're a little different. So sometimes when you see people say all the traditions are the same, all religions are talking about the same thing, I don't think they are. I think they might be pointing to the same kind of spiritual place. They might be pointing to the same kind of concepts, but their methods and even their outcomes are a little different depending on what they used in order to get to that place. And I think understanding that helps in understanding where alchemy comes from and why alchemy is a little different from seated meditation where I'm just listening to the breath or absorbing into the breath. Now, alchemy is a mind-body <laughs> practice, we might say, the two being used together. Ultimately, any process we, we look at in alchemy, we come at it from two different angles at the same time. And you can see this in the practices because the body-based practices are very um, almost physical. They're based on breath, they're based on energetic work, they're based on um, everything from controlled contractions of certain regions of the body through the relax and release of other regions of the body. There's moving exercises and, and things like this, but quite physical, things that work with the body's functioning to change how it functions on the inside. To me, those parts of alchemy are kind of refining of the workshop, you know? Any good alchemist, any wild-eyed, long-haired alchemist looking like the doc from Back to the Future but carrying all these chemicals around, needs a good workshop to work in, right? They need their space. And the physical body side of it to me is getting the workshop ready, taking its functioning to a very efficient level. But then we also have the mind aspect of the training as well, which is more in line with other meditation systems. Now the reason for this is because in Chinese arts, in, in Taoism, they believe that the body is just an expression of the mind as much as, as much as anything. So certain emotions and mental qualities are kind of anchored into regions of the body. So Chinese medicine people, you'll be familiar with the idea that the liver is, resonates with the emotion of anger, or we could even say the hun, the, the aspect of our spirit that gets frustrated and generates anger, is anchored into the liver. Yeah? And we might say that um, whatever, I don't know, the fear, okay, and this idea of our willpower is anchored and rooted into the kidneys. Okay? There's a resonance there between the body and the mind. Now most Chinese medical practitioners would be familiar with this, and Qigong practitioners I would imagine as well. But what's not as understood quite so often is that every single substance and every single part of your body is an anchor for a particular aspect of your consciousness, a particular realm of your thought processes. Yeah? So an easy example would be something like your blood. So your blood okay, is said to root essentially your mind. Um, some say it roots your spirit, but also it gives you a connection to the idea of kind of grace and mental flow and things like this. So people with very sort of stuck blood in Chinese medicine, even though that might sound like a strange term, if that blood is very stagnant, then actually that kind of mental fluidity can be affected and gracefulness um, can be affected, even down to affecting your kind of physical clumsiness might go up as well as your inability to be uh, mentally fluid. Yeah, so the, that's one example. And all of the different parts of the bodies and tissues root and anchor these different parts of your consciousness. Now, with regards to the Jing, the Qi, and the Shen, well, let's leave the Shen for now. Let's talk about the Jing and the Qi. Each of these root a part of your emotional makeup too, or your psychological makeup. So if I want to, I don't know, refine the Jing, the essence, the first of the substance, I will need a physical method, and I will need to understand what is the mental process that's connected to the Jing in the first place. Because if my method is awesome, <laughs> and I know all the methods for refining my gym, I know, Jing, I know how to do the breathing, and I know how to do the physical work, I know how to do the contractions and the exercises, and I got the best method ever, and I try to refine that Jing, it's still not going to work unless the mental quality is there as well. We have to learn how to deal with and refine the mental quality related to the Jing. The two must come together, right? 
If on the other hand, in alchemy I know how to work with the mental quality, I may settle the Jing, but I won't be able to refine it because I need the physical tool. I need the body because my body is what I'm using in alchemy to then refine it. So the two must come together. And I, I, will, I have to say, I don't want to be mean, but it does feel often like a lot of people approaching Taoist alchemy are almost in one of the two camps. You know, so you get these people saying that alchemy really is just about mental qualities. It's all about just refining your Xing, man, your nature, and, and, and it, the work will happen. And then other people say, oh no, it's all just about sort of calisthenics and control of the breath and the energy and your mind doesn't matter. It's all about the body. Um, and that's not quite true either. It, it's the coming together of the two that is really, really important. You can't just use a physical method. You can't just use a meditative method in order to refine these substances according to alchemical teachings. There's always three components to anything that converts in Taoism is kind of their magic number, the trinity. Um, and essentially what we need for the three components is a container, always what they call a ding or a cauldron is usually what they refer to. If ever you've been to a Chinese temple, um, often in the middle of the courtyard what you'll get is a really big cauldron called a ding with three legs, always got three legs representing the, the trinity. Um, and often they light incense in these ding to offer to the gods or, or to give reference at the temple. Now these cauldrons are used metaphorically within the body, even sometimes drawn in the body in the, the sort of um, charts and diagrams of alchemy. And the cauldron is one of the ingredients, right? You need it. You need a container. So what that means is I need to know the location in the body where that work is carried out. Sometimes it's a lower abdomen, sometimes it's a perineum, sometimes it's in the heart, sometimes it's in the mind. Sometimes that location, this particular cauldron, actually exists outside of the physical body within the realm of the consciousness, but it still has a locality that I'm working with to a certain degree. So that's section one. Ingredient two, ingredient one, sorry, ingredient one, ingredient two would then be the physical work that I do. Maybe it's my breath. Maybe that cauldron needs to contain the outcome of my breath work. Maybe that cauldron needs to contain the outcome of my Qigong exercises. Maybe that cauldron needs to contain the outcome of whatever transformation I'm doing with the nervous system or with the endocrine system. Okay, It all goes into that container. The third ingredient would then be the mental quality. I've got the cauldron, I put the ingredients in of my work, and then I need to mix it up and, and, and cook it, and ultimately the mental quality must be used as well. And the mental quality is not enough to just be, I concentrate on it, or I focus on it, or I imagine it happening, or I guide it. There's actually an underlying quality that needs to be there as well. So it's not just something you can do, there must be an actual change to your nature, a change to your perception, so that there's a switch in the quality of that mental energy. And when they come together within that space within the body, then the conversion starts to play, take place. What they call the cooking or the firing will start to unfold. And there's these processes all the time with these three ingredients needed, the body method, the mind method, and the container or the cauldron or the workspace. And they come together in different regions of the body at different stages to alchemically cook these substances. So I think really this is the hallmark of alchemy, and of course my expertise lies in the Chinese systems more than the others, so I'm happy to be corrected on alchemy from other traditions of course, but within Taoist alchemy this would kind of be the hallmark, right? The coming together of body work um, and meditative work or mental training, Shinfa, into one integrated whole to generate that change. So the first of our substances to convert would be the essence or the jing, okay? um, which is sometimes called the sexual fluid or the sexual essence within some traditions um, and sometimes uh, referred to as being linked to the kidneys or generally linked to kidneys in the lower abdominal region or sometimes the perineum. Essentially it's this region of the body down here. So the container aspect of this work is normally considered to be the lower dantian the lower dantian or the lower elixir field, the field within which can be cultivated that which is needed to develop the elixir, okay, that spiritual substance that will appear within the body. Now I've spoken at length before about how adult humans don't actually have a dantian when they begin the practice. They certainly don't have the dan, the spiritual substance. It's not been gathered. It's not been 
brought together. You might have the ingredients within your body, but it hasn't been turned, the recipe hasn't been created to create the dan, you know what I mean? Just like you could say you could go into a supermarket and uh, all of the ingredients are there on the shelf for the cake, but the cake is not made because the flour and the sugar and the other things you need are all there, but they need putting together. Same with this elixir that we build inside the body. The field is also not built usually in adults because ultimately there's not enough gathering of chi in that region for the cultivation to take place. Chi or energy within your body has one key quality for me that's very, very important in that chi hua it's called, which is ultimately the transforming action of the chi. So if I want something to take place, if I want that cauldron to contain the results of my breath work, uh, my body work, sorry, and the result of my mental work, then I'm going to need the chi to be there as a catalyst. There always has to be some. Okay, got three ingredients plus my catalyst. And in the case of the lower abdominal field, I need that chi to gather. So in the early stages of both qigong and neidan, alchemy, or neigong even, there is a gathering of chi into the abdomen. And it's more like generally the abdomen, usually the abdomen, sometimes a bit lower towards the perineum, sometimes a little higher, but around that region, different traditions will vary. And in my experience, it's not actually, you know, I don't think it makes a great deal of difference which of the, like, which of the locations they put it in, because sometimes traditions tend to be focusing on the source of the jing. Sometimes they tend to be focusing on the source of the chi, which are very close together. And then they're mixing these two substances within one of these locations. So it's kind of arbitrary, um, ultimately, on which of these two positions or three positions they place the lower dantian is. What is most important is that the dantian is not too far forward. Most people put their mind too far forward. It should be in. But whether that dantian exists at the perineum or exists slightly above the perineum, actually, it's not that important for the work. The most important thing is that you just have a method and then you stick with whichever of those methods it is that you're, you're working with. So, the catalyst of the qi must be gathered. Um, and this is actually easier to do with qigong than it is with um, neidan, in my opinion, my experience. So I think usually a wise start point for many practitioners is a very efficient qigong system focused on the lower dantian or a neigong system focused on the lower dantian before moving on to alchemy, before moving on to neidan. I think that's a more sensible place because while you can't do the spiritual refinement in qigong as easily, definitely not, wrong tool for the job, you can gather the catalyst, if you like, the catalyst for the energy in that area that's going to enable the, the conversion of these substances, right? So the lower dantian, the jing is connected to it. And then we should understand that the jing really has a couple of parts to it. <laughs> Always the same. Three parts, of course it does. As a yin, comp yin component, a yang component, and then it also has a mental component as well with regards to the jing, and we need to understand the three. And essence really confuses people. I can see from the writings people get kind of hung up on, on jing and, and kind of get confused with it. Ultimately, your jing is comprised of, first of all, let's look at the yin and yang parts. The yin part, the yin part of your jing, is ultimately the actual part of it that goes on to produce substance. So we could even say in the case of what is commonly linked to Jing, your sexual fluids are generated. So the sperm in the case of men, um, the seminal fluid is generated from the yin aspect of the Jing, right? Now, that doesn't mean that your sexual, and sexual fluids are Jing, they're just produced by it, but they are the kind of outcome of the yin aspect of the Jing. Now the yin aspect of the Jing, the fluids, okay, can actually be reproduce quite easily. They can be reproduced by a process of what you eat and what you drink. Okay, essentially when you consume food and drink you will produce more of that substance within the body. What is a little bit more difficult to reproduce and, and dare I say nigh on impossible is the yang aspect of the jing which is the part that is given to you essentially at conception um, and then passes into your life and you have a, a, a um, what do you call it, like a, 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 a temporary source of it, um, a limited supply of, you have a limited supply of this um, substance, this yang aspect of the jing is finite. I can replace the fluid aspect, especially of the sexual flows, I can reproduce that through my food and my drink, but I can't reproduce the yang aspect of the essence, which is like the spark, the electrical current, the current of life that exists within those fluids. In alchemy, they talk about jing, 
once it's been converted into that kind of sexual energy um, as being like water that contains fire. That's the analogy. So the water is the substance, the thickness of the fluids, and the fire is the spark that's contained within it. There's confusion around this because, of course, many alchemy books will talk about things like not ejaculating so as not to lose the essence, or um, in some case to sort of ejaculate, <laughs> if you like, learning methods to absorb the semen back into the body so you don't lose um, any of the essence, that sort of finite aspect of the, of the jing. But it's not actually quite needed, it's not quite right. Actually what happens in alchemy um, is that we learn how to, through specific body and mental methods, to extract the yang aspect of the jing out of the yin fluids. As you take the spark out, the electrical spark, the spark of life, that comes out. And that is then returned back into the system. But the yin aspect of the jing, which ultimately will normally manifest as sexual fluids in the case of men, or menstrual blood in the case of women, can then be shed from the body. It can be got rid of. Once the, the, the semen has the life taken out of it, the bit that we want for the alchemy, the other bit's not needed and it can be shed. So all of those sort of reabsorbing the semen is not really required. You need to learn how to extract the yang from the yin. The third component of the, of the jing, the essence, is your mental quality, which is your base desires, your desire for sexuality and power and fear and dominance and greed and all of those kind of things that so we would sometimes associate with the kind of base chakra within um, certain yogic traditions or the kind of lowest animal part of you, that animal survival part of your brain. Those mental qualities are linked to the essence. So ultimately what needs to happen is we need to extract the yang ingredient from the jing, get rid of the yin aspect of the jing because this can be regathered through our food and our drink anyway to reproduce those substances, but the yang spark cannot. And then the yang spark, once it's been extracted, needs to be moved. And how we move it um, is through a combination of a physical exercise, normally a breathing exercise, combined with the ability to deal with our desires and the animal part of our nature. Because if that yang spark is extracted, but the mental quality of the jing is not dealt with, then all that will happen is a fire will blaze that will actually exaggerate that part of a person's mind. So they can become more power hungry, more fearful, more greedy, more sexually driven, whatever it is, whatever is the dominant part of their animal side of their nature. So then mental exercises are needed, which will include anything from ethics and morality. That would be like an external change to the mind for me from a tradition. But also then um, meditative training more in line with what you might associate with some of the Buddhist systems to develop a calm, centered, stable mind that is able to penetrate through to the nature of the origin of why these thoughts are here till they can be dealt with and transmuted ultimately so that animal nature is quelled and once it has no control over a person then that yang spark can start to move it can start to move through the body the result of it moving through the body is it's no longer causing damage to the system it's not generating more of those desires instead it just gets moved into the nerves and moves through and start to build more chi within the body. And this is the beginning of the refining of the jing to the chi. Now, sometimes people worry, if I convert all my jing to chi, do I run out of jing? But it doesn't work like that because ultimately when that yang spark is extracted and sent into the body, if it's done correctly, then the result of it is the yang spark will generate more chi and then move into the head and then start to produce a change in the body system that actually generates more jing. Okay, it actually sort of reinforces that process. You get a kind of cycle taking place within the body that's a little complex to understand, um, but ultimately that's the basis of it. Okay, without going into methods or anything, this is the basis of the process. So, to recap, what do you need? You need three things. You need the, the location, the cauldron. You need the body work, uh, and then you need the mental work. And in the case of the essence, the location is normally either the perineum or the lower dantian, depending on what tradition um, you're from. And then the idea is that the physical work is normally breath work and energetic control and bodily control to extract that yang spark. And then the mental quality of dealing with the animal desires is required. And then that will start to mobilize that yang spark through the body to really kind of start the alchemy process off. And for all of that to happen, we want a gathering of chi, which is what we call the, the field 
okay, the lower field, sometimes called the Sha Tian instead of the Dan Tian by some traditions, to gather that Qi in here. And this is the catalyst through which all of this process takes place. There's a lot more to it. Um, and this early part of it is sometimes called the firing process or lighting the cauldron, and lighting the ding, right, for this conversion to take place. Um, and generally what you'll need is a, a teacher to work through that with you. Um, but this is the foundations of it. This is the foundation of what it means to establish the early stage of converting the jing. Now refining the qi within the body is an interesting process because um, in alchemy refining the qi can refer to a couple of things. I would argue that in the early stages of refining the qi, maybe early to intermediate, what we're essentially talking about is something very similar to Chinese medicine. So in Chinese medicine there's a whole model for how um, energy is extracted largely from the air you breathe um, and from the food you eat or the drink you, you consume and then it's converted within the body via a, a connected process of the organs, the viscera, the Zhang Fu organs and this generates functioning of the body, ultimately functional activities of the body. Now that can happen inefficiently, which will produce poor health, or efficiently, which will produce good health. So in the early stages of alchemy, a lot of the refining of the qi means to do the same as Chinese medicine, to take that process of developing energy from breathing and food to the highest level we can, to produce radiant health. Now that radiant health is considered the foundation. It's almost like the catalyst, once again, within which the rest of the work takes place, right? This is, this is going to assist with this alchemy process. But then there's a higher level of qi development, which ultimately means to control um, from the yang spark of the jing, right, that was previously going on to produce the potential for more life. It was going to go into your sexual fluids to produce um, the potential for a child, or it was going to be sparked up and then utilized to develop vital functions of the body, such as cell reproduction and things like this. But the idea is because I've refined that yang spark to such a high level, it's kind of like I've got spare, you know what I mean? Like I've refined it, I haven't lost it, I've extracted it from that process so I can do something with it. So it is then returned to the source, is what they say, which is that yang spark is then sent through the channels, which will start to ignite the nerves, okay? That sounds bad, it's not negative, we don't set fire to your nervous system, but it does bring it to life, okay? Cause it to sparkle, to generate an increased electrical stimulation through the nervous system. As it goes through the system, this will light start to go up and then start to impact the glandular aspects of your body, okay, the, the hormonal system. They then start to produce um, a kind of energy that moves into your system that is then picked up by the cells and, and revitalizes them. So then now we have a, a higher degree of energy production within the body. And this is what we call refining the energy, refining the qi. The basis of refining the qi is that yang spark has to move through the system in order to enable that qi to be produced um, at a high level, this extra energy. It's like a step up beyond health. So if you think about like when you're born, you have a kind of, you're born with a certain degree of qi. It's almost like playing cards. You've got a hand you're dealt with. That's all you can work with. Those are the cards you've got. So with regards to your qi, we can kind of work with that to a certain degree. I can be healthier or less healthier. I can be younger. I can be older or, or whatever and, and work with that qi but I'm still only going to be within my sort of usual or normal capacity. But with regards to an alchemy practitioner, the idea is to max out that capacity, to take it to another level, so that your whole body becomes a kind of energetic factory for producing more of this substance. And this can only happen when the yang spark of the jing can, where well they call it the jing hua, actually, the yang spark, which means kind of the um, cream of the crop, the most refined part of the jing. And what it does is that when it goes into the body, it changes the way that it functions so that we can produce more qi. And all of this happens as a relationship between the hormonal system and the, the cellular system. But this is what's happening. Now, that extra qi that is built inside the body also has a mental component to it as well, right? And that mental component really is your connection to your emotions and your mental activities as much as anything, the movements of your mind. So at this stage, the physical process, the physical work, would be the actual refining of that Jing Hua into energy within the body. Um, but then the mental aspect would be to deal with, <laughs> dare I say, not to end, but to deal with your attachments and relationship to the emotions and the mind. There must be inner calm and stillness 
developed. Because otherwise what will happen is that extra energy is just going to feed that side of your nature and then you're going to get more emotions, more mental activity, which will produce scheming and, <laughs> and things like this and a kind of overactivity of the mind till it sort of burns you out and makes you overly intellectual in a kind of negative way. Um, but it'll also fire up the nervous system to put you in a kind of fight or flight state, which we don't really want. So we have the mental quality of calm and stillness um, developed through meditative training, standard meditative training, very similar to what you might encounter in other traditions, but then the body work is used as well. And then when that chi, that extra chi is not being used for the mental processes, it will then go on to assist us in the refinement process towards building the elixir, okay, towards refining it towards Shen. So how this is done is when the body is functioning at an incredibly high level, then the first of the substances is produced. The extra chi that you're producing through your alchemy process produces a kind of substance that rains down from the heavens, if you like. It comes down from the brain, drains down through the body, and it starts to produce um, more of the potential for this elixir, this dan within the body. It'll, it'll taste sweet and it will appear in your saliva, and sometimes they call it the amrita, um, or the jade fluid in Chinese alchemy. And this is a kind of a deepening of this refinement process. So the Jing to Qi process really is what we've looked at so far, refining of the Jing and refining of the Qi. And we have all kinds of body work exercises and mental processes involved, but it takes some time. It takes some time. It's, it's a lengthy practice, just like a meditation practice. It's something people engage with um, for regularly on a day-to-day -day basis, has to be integrated into their life. Now, this is where we have to understand that the mind and the body coming together, sometimes known as the Xing and the Ming, um, or the kind of physical work, energetic work, and the mental work, the meditative training, the ethical and moral code must come together as one. Because otherwise, you don't have all the ingredients for the cake. You can't build the elixir. You've got the cauldron. <laughs> You've got one of the ingredients, but not the other. They have to be combined. So your method cannot be based on, in alchemy in my opinion, cannot be based on just simply doing energy work. I'm going to draw this energy through this channel and I'm going to move these lights through these organs and send it down to this place and I'm going to refine this chi and then I'm going to picture this. You can't do that on its own, you know. It's not, it's not adequate. That's one side of it. Ultimately that's kind of energetic calisthenics, but it's not really going to do the alchemy process. You have to have the mental side of it too. There has to be the, um, the meditative training, the refinement of the mind, the refinement of the nature, the development of these qualities such as concentration and stability of mind, um, openness of heart if you want, even things like this, so that when these qualities come together then they will refine that process. Because otherwise, as they state within Taoism, the mind and the emotions are just going to leak the results of your practice, or in my opinion, more than leak it, those energies can actually fuel that side of your nature and send you off down a <laughs> dark path which you don't really want to follow.